Welcome to everyone. This is the first webinar from the Center for Non-Traditional Security Studies at the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies, Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. The title of today's webinar is Humanitarian Futures in a Post-COVID World. We have four speakers with us today. And at the end of the session, there will be a question and answer segment. Uh, so please use the chat function at the bottom of your screens to enter in your questions we will then collate them and relay those questions to the panelists. Our first speaker is Beres Gwyn, founder and director of Inkatare, based in Geneva, Switzerland. Then we will have Pak Said Faisal, the former executive director of the ASEAN Coordinating Center for Humanitarian Assistance on Disaster Management, or AHA Center. Then we will have Dr. Lina Gong, research fellow at the NTS Center here at RSIS. And finally, Professor Meli Caballero Anthony, Professor of International Relations and Head of Center of the Center for Non Traditional Security Studies. Beres, over to you. Thanks very much, Alastair, and uh, greetings to all from Geneva. It's a pleasure to be able to join you today uh, at a point in human history that I think is significant and at a time when more and more people are starting to ask about strategic foresight, future thinking as a pathway to new approaches uh, to solve some of the problems and to prepare for the next century. If I could have the first of the PowerPoint slides, thank you very much. Albert Einstein is one of my favorite people. Uh, not only was he an extraordinary scientist, but he was a profound thinker, but a man of huge common sense. At least if we take the number of quotes that are attributed to him as an indication. On the left hand side here, uh, Professor Einstein reminds us that whatever question it is we're trying to solve, more time should be spent on asking the right questions rather than offering immediately a variety of solutions. The second uh, reminds us that to keep doing the same things over and over again and expect different results is some form of insanity. Uh, Stephen Covey is also quoted as saying, if we keep what we doing what we're doing, we're going to get what we're getting. And finally, we have again from Albert Einstein, problems cannot be solved with the same mindset that created them. It's been this kind of thinking that led me to assume that futures thinking is not just a new technique or tool, the latest elite sport for consultants or flavor of the month. It requires a different mindset. It's not an optional extra for us, it's an imperative as we enter a new era in human history and we find ourselves in volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous times. It's true that we're facing unprecedented challenges, but we also have unprecedented opportunities to optimize capabilities to thrive. Some would even suggest that it's a matter of survival in a better, fairer and less dangerous world. More of the same, bigger, better and faster is not going to help. It's just compounding the damage that we have inflicted on the planet while we've been in charge. And at a time of imperiled leadership, humanity is being asked to lift its game. Uh, Chris, to the next slide, please. Although described in different ways, what we will call foresight or futures thinking is described by the School of International Futures in the UK as a habit of mind. It exists on the individual level, but can also be developed on the collective level. It's a sustained facilitated process, not a one-off event, which helps to overcome our individual biases and move us towards a shared appreciation of the nature of the challenges we're facing, the origins of those challenges over time, and then to brainstorm on ways forward. Importantly, from the School of International Futures perspective, strategic foresight doesn't end with scenario planning. It's proactive, not passive. It reminds us that we have human agency 
In fact, it reminds us that we have a responsibility, but empowers us to think that we actually are in a position to do something about this complex array of challenges that we're facing. UNESCO has done quite a bit of work in this area with a program that they have termed Futures Literacy, which leads to, again, more buzzwords, anticipatory leadership. They talk about futures literacy as a capability that allows us to better understand the way the future impacts what we're doing now. Our understanding of the future can lead us to hope or fear. It can lead us to make sense or to, to find meaning. But what we imagine drives our expectations of what can or should be done in the here and now. We predict, we fear and we hope and we forget often that anticipation is sometimes a major force in defining the scope of our ambition in terms of what can be done to solve some of the problems that we're facing. If we only use the past to make sense of the future, then we will extrapolate from our lived experiences and do more of the same. And so through futures thinking, we're able to take a deeper look at what is going on and to define what needs to be done. The next slide, please. So Haya Tullo is based in Australia. He's done quite a lot of work around futures thinking, in fact, over several decades, and developed a six pillar framework. But in the course of his section on deepening our understanding, he uses the metaphor of the iceberg, which shows that so often we deal only with what's visible when what's actually underneath the surface is far more important, far more dangerous, but also offering far more resources. It's the systems and the narratives that are underneath the surface that are behind the headlines or the tweets that we see from day to day on social media. And the myths and metaphors, the stories that we tell are a powerful part of shaping who we are and what we do. Next slide. There are many now who are using strategic foresight and futures thinking to warn us about planetary emergencies, environmental emergencies, health emergencies. But from my observation of all of the efforts that have taken place through multilateral circles at national levels, at regional levels, the greater danger facing us at the moment is actually a cognitive crisis. That in our rush to modernity, we've actually lost contact with nature, with our place in the world, with our place in the universe. And we have developed a Western approach to learning and thinking that has actually resulted in a specialization that prevents us from thinking more broadly um, in a more profound way uh, about the issues that are facing us. As you can see from some of the cartoons, we make fun of some of our habits. But in fact, these are deeply ingrained. They're in our minds as habit forming. And this is where changing our mindset is a significant part of what needs to take place. Just running through very quickly what we have now in the next slides, uh, if you could go to the world views, it saddens me often to observe the levels of surprise on the faces of people who see these representations of the world's population for the first time even among those who regard themselves as international development and humanitarian affairs experts. In today's world, where 10% of us can be regarded as well off, but 1% have twice the wealth of the whole of humanity combined, even among the informed in UN organizations, there are major blind spots. What might have worked before isn't enough. The picture on the left shows population, on the top right hand side, you then have an image of the world by wealth and below that an image of the world by population growth. It doesn't take a lot of deep thought to realize that this is not a sustainable future for many in the world who will choose to uh, want a better life rather than to be accepting of the life that would be inevitable if we do nothing. The ecological footprint, which is our next slide, also is something we've known about for decades. We've known that our version of capitalism, again, reverting to the 10% who enjoy most of its benefits, is using the world's resources at an unsustainable rate. In the slide that follows, we have plenty of information available to us 
using AI, big data, remote sensing, GIS, etc., to tell us that there is already a crisis of water, that this is going to get worse in the foreseeable future and will, of course, have impact on food production. When we add the map for climate vulnerability and the map for urbanization, we demonstrate there the real prospect of a major catastrophe looming if there were to be, as the World Economic Forum has suggested, a possible simultaneous failure of food production in various parts of the world. So our urbanization reminds us too that for many of us now more living in the cities, we've also lost contact with that natural rhythm of the environment that we need to restore. Turning again to the Global Economic Forum, every year they produce an excellent global risks report. And in the last report, launched in January this year, they referred to health systems globally at risk of becoming unfit for purpose. In fact, moving to the next slide, last year, the World Economic Forum had commissioned a report on health systems globally and warned that there was a real possibility of pandemics which required action on a number of fronts. And if you look at the list of dash points there, you will recognize exactly the dimensions that have been affected in the COVID-19 pandemic. Might some first steps have been helpful? On to our last slide. Futures thinking is not science fiction. It's not some kind of feel good exercise. It requires us to plan from possible and plausible futures to change what we're doing now. We talk about mindsets, which implies a certain permanence, but I'd like to re repurpose that language to suggest that what we need is a mind that is set to recognize and work to address the blind spots that we each of us have. And while we need to work within the existing constraints and institutions to be much more active in experimenting with alternatives uh, to the systems in place, to take us forward. Thanks very much, Alastair, back to you. Thank you, Beres. Uh, and thank you for highlighting this cognitive crisis that is preventing that broader thinking uh, and to challenge us to think more broadly uh, and even experimentally. With that, I'll turn now to Pak Said Faisal. Al, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for RSIS uh, as well for uh, hosting the event. Uh, I think uh, what uh, being said by uh, Barris is very uh, a good start in giving us a perspective about uh, how to handle uh, the future uh, and, and uh, pointed very right that we cannot use the past uh, to solve uh, the future. So that is something that uh, I think I will start uh, with uh, humanitarian uh, perspective, uh, what we call futures after uh, post-COVID-19. Uh, <clears throat> three things that I see uh, could be a, a change in the future. And, and of course, uh, it, it really depends on how, how far we want to go. Uh, first is about the landscape, the humanitarian landscape in the future. Let go, let's see if we go for uh, 2050. Uh, by 2050, the PricewaterhouseCoopers, uh, one of the reputable uh, fi uh, financial firm, predicted that uh, there would be a change of economic power. The biggest power machine in the world, number one, in 2050 would be China, followed by India, then United States, and then after that, Indonesia. And then after that, if I'm not mistaken, was uh, Brazil. So what does it mean? It's a changing of donors, actually. So those country at this stage or now is at the receiving end. By 2050, would be at the giving end. And perhaps, we don't know, there will be a change as well that the country at the current stage, at the giving end, will be at the receiving end in the future. 
So what we are telling the country now is about uh, how to conduct humanitarian. What does it mean a good humanitarian activities? Because that is uh, the lesson that they will accumulate. And when this country become a big economic power, most likely they will copy that approach as well. So there'll be change of uh, donors. Uh, number two, in the landscape that we have a change of uh, nationalism over internationalism. It means country would be more and more nationalist. How that will affect the humanitarian world? It is most unlikely that international assistance will be accepted uh, in the country that uh, they have a strong economy and then they have a very strong uh, nationalism. Because uh, we have seen that even now, uh, more and more uh, country uh, will be less likely to accept international assistance. Uh, why is that? Because there's a growing perception of international assistance uh, becoming a liability, perhaps, instead of asset. Because receiving assistance is more difficult than giving assistance. So now the country with that perception uh, and then uh, accumulating knowledge and wealth, uh, then it most likely uh, they will not go so much for requesting international assistance. So it, it was shrinking the humanitarian uh, space. Uh, the KPI, perhaps in the future, for this country would be uh, the scale of uh, the the big scale of disaster. Then they are able not to ask for international assistance. So not asking international assistance perhaps can be a new success measure uh, in the future. Uh, on this context, the landscape, the change of donors, nationalism over internationalism. Uh, the third one is the speed of technology. I think uh, COVID really showing uh, how uh, technology changed us. I mean, what we are doing today, uh, about five months ago, I think very limited people know uh, about Zoom. Now it become uh, Zoominar, uh, uh, Zoom gathering, uh, Zoom meeting. Uh, very soon will be a verb. So uh, in the future with the speed of technology, the question whether the current method of assessment will be the same or not. Or even we need an assessment where people, we send people from different country just to conduct assessment because perhaps technology taking over that uh, work already. Perhaps the way we give donation. Uh, donation perhaps can be direct in the future. Now we have seen that more. Uh, I've seen in Indonesia where uh, the uh, fundraising uh, platform uh, quite uh, growing and people just donate and it goes straight to beneficiary. So uh, this it's very good because in terms of the uh, technology, uh, the innovation, uh, innovation is always challenging status quo, while disruption is about making status quo irrelevant. So if the humanitarian, uh, what we call uh, actors organization is about, is a uh, status quo, then innovation will constantly challenge uh, that. And perhaps if we get to into the disruption stage, then it will make us irrelevant. The, they always try to cut the middlemen. That is what the technology is all about. So one is about the landscape. Number two is about changing of actors. Uh, what we can see more and more uh, local actors will take the lead. We have seen it now uh, in, in, in some of the country, we'll see it more. Uh, why is it then? Because the accumulation of knowledge, accumulation of confidence, accumulation of wealth of, of that particular country and the, the country itself, like giving more role, giving more space for the local organization or local actors. So they will take more lead. Uh, also in the future, in terms of actors, the private sector foundations uh, getting into the game. Uh, now uh, we can observe in COVID-19, a lot of private sectors really donating, giving, 
And, and this give, a, give them the experience that, hey, we can do this. We should make this uh, as a good thing that we continue. So now we have a private sector. They have wealth, they have knowledge, and they set up the foundation and do the humanitarian. So that is another possibility. More and more private sector foundation is getting into the game. Uh, number three in this uh, actors uh, is about the rise of a regional organization humanitarian network. So uh, uh, more and more regional organization uh, will, uh, what we call, take more active role. Uh, the, the ASEAN, the South Africa, uh, the Caribbean. Uh, in the future, I can see that they will link, they will provide a, a strong network. And, and this is the, what we call the bridge between the national and international. With less international uh, intervention, then the space is open for the uh, regional organization. So we'll see this more. So one is the landscape, two is the actors. The last one I will talk uh, in this uh, 10 minutes is about the skills. The humanitarian, the future of humanitarian, uh, I've said about uh, the landscape, the actors, uh, the conditions, uh, will uh, force us to adapt uh, or to have new skills. Uh, what are the skills that uh, will determine uh, the, the, our, our future, the humanitarian future? Uh, one is about ability to adapt and ability to reinvent ourselves. So if we set up an organization that very bureaucratic, very difficult uh, to uh, change, very difficult to adapt. Uh, I think it would be very challenging for this type of organization to survive uh, in uncertainty and in a changing world because uh, ability to adapt, ability to reinvent ourselves becomes more important than ability to predict because the, the future becomes more and more unpredictable. So organization must have must build its skill in ability to adapt and ability to reinvent uh, uh, themselves. Uh, number two in the skills, uh, the second skills is about ability to collaborate and ability to build network. Uh, the collaboration that we have seen in this COVID-19 uh, is very impressive. I think in, in different countries and even my countries, uh, we have seen how different actors getting into uh, being together because that's what it takes to solve the complex problem. Uh, ability to uh, collaborate will, will what we call bring weakness and strength, combine that, become a new strength and eliminate, minimize the weakness. Ability to build a network, it's much easier to pass the uh, lesson learned, the knowledge and so on. So ability to collaborate and build network become a critical. Uh, it is very difficult to see an organization to survive uh, of being very good of doing things by themselves. So uh, collaborate and build network uh, would be one of the things that we should do. Uh, last uh, is about the skill, uh, the skill that we need to develop is ability to build trust and relationship. I think this is very important because uh, we're talking about humanitarian. Uh, the basis of humanitarian is uh, humanity and the foundation of humanity is about trust and relationship. So being pushed to uh, industry so far, uh, I think uh, this skill is being uh, what we call considered less important. Uh, somehow those who are very good at building trust and relationship is not considered as a necessary uh, you know, professional skills anymore. So you need more on the uh, other, what we call very tangible skill. But this is the foundation of uh, humanitarian. And uh, the issue of the shrinking humanitarian space is the issue of shrinking the trust and relationship. That is the, what we call uh, the issue that we face now. In the future, with all the technology, with all the changing, I think ability to build trust and to build relationship will determine the survival of any humanitarian organization. Thank you, Al, that's from me. Thank you, Pak.
Uh, as part of your presentation, you mentioned changing actors. And so we have our, our next speaker, uh, Lena Gong, who is going to share with us her experience over some of the observations of an emerging donor, China, in the humanitarian system. Um, before I move over to her, again, if people do have their questions, please use the chat function at the bottom of your screen to enter in uh, your questions to the speakers. We'll collate these um, and ask the panelists at the end uh, your questions. Lena, it's over to you. Thank you, Al. It's a great pleasure to join an excellent panel to discuss this very important uh, topic for the humanitarian community. My contribution to the discussion today is from the perspective of emerging donors. Specifically because of time constraint, I will focus only on China. Next slide, please. So essentially, uh, we have seen a lot of uh, challenges to the humanitarian system since the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. First, we have seen the search, of, uh, the search for humanitarian needs. The United Nations has issued a 6.7 billion appeal for um, funds uh, for the Global Humanitarian Response Plan. And more importantly, we have seen the demands for items which are not traditional or conventional humanitarian aid, like masks, sanitizers, personal equipment, uh, personal protective equipment, etc. So this asks us to think how we should plan our humanitarian aid in the future in view of the uncertainties we will be facing. In addition, we are facing competing needs. Uh, first, COVID-19 induced like, insecurities among the vulnerable uh, communities, like food insecurities and economic insecurities, etc. In addition, we also face the overlap of disasters. Like a few weeks ago, we see the uh, tropical storms that hit South Asia. And third, when we are expecting more donations to the humanitarian system, the traditional donors are struggling with their domestic challenges. So as a result, we are seeing a lot of um, gaps emerging. So the widening gaps between the humanitarian needs and demands. So that brings in the discussion or the role of uh, emerging donors. And China is the focus of uh, this presentation. But before to uh, discuss about China, I would like to highlight that actually in South Asia, we also see the opportunity and uh, potential for emergence of uh, new donors. Indonesia in 2019 already launched a about 200 million uh, worth of international development aid fund, which is a signal of the country's intention to transform from a recipient only, uh, but to a donor as well, as Pak Faisal just mentioned. In addition, during the outbreak of uh, COVID-19, we also see Vietnam making a lot of donations of uh, medical supplies to uh, other countries. So given the uncertainties in the future we will be facing, so we can see a lot of opportunities for countries from this region or from the developing world to contribute the humanitarian um, needs. And in the next uh, few slides, I will be introducing how China has been conducting humanitarian diplomacy and how uh, China will be able to conduct humanitarian uh, diplomacy in the future and what are the challenges and opportunities. Next slide, please. So essentially, uh, where is uh, humanitarian diplomacy in China's foreign policy? To be honest, uh, my observation is that humanitarian affairs is on the periphery of China's foreign policy. It is only part of China's um, overall bilateral relations with uh, particular countries or China's relations with multilateral organizations. It has yet become an independent agenda of uh, China's foreign policy or international behavior. 
And second, China used hum the word humanitarian uh, in a very strict or careful sense. Usually it's, asso it's uh, associated with emergency aid as indicated in the white paper of uh, China's, white, uh, China's foreign aid in 2014. And among the issues China have been involved in uh, the humanitarian affairs, health issue has been a traditional component. As I will be discussing in the next slides that um, actually health is one of the, uh, the health sector is one of the key destination of the Chinese aid. And China provides aid uh, in what manner or through which channels China have been contributing to the international humanitarian system. First, uh, the bilateral approach is the preferred way for China, is the uh, uh, way China is most comfortable with. And the second one is uh, the UN system, which provides a very important uh, platform for China to contribute to different issues of um, humanitarian concerns. And in recent years, China has uh, initiated some new uh, fund funds like the South South Cooperation Assistance Fund, which was uh, launched in 2015. China pledged 2 billion US dollars. And in 2017, during the Belt and Road, uh, Belt and Road uh, Forum, China pledged an additional 1 billion US dollars. And usually we have uh, seen China uh, implement the projects under the South-South Cooperation Assistance Fund uh, with the UN agencies operating in the field, as later I will be discussed. Uh, and the third one, the, set, the, the next one will be the United Nations Peace and Development Trust Fund. In 2015, China uh, pledged about 200 million US dollars over a period of 10 years. And in 2016, China's premier also mentioned that part of the fund will be used to support issues like refugees. And the third initiative related to this topic is the Belt and Road. Um, because the Belt and Road has expanded China's uh, presence abroad, so it's become more relevant and uh, to China's interest uh, to assist other countries to deal with their challenges. And what are the issues facing China at the moment to uh, engage in humanitarian issues? Uh, in my observation, I think China has a different framing. China preferred to use um, the developmental uh, approach rather than humanitarian uh, approach. As I just mentioned, China used uh, the word humanitarian in a very strict sense. And one of the reason is that uh, humanitarianism is um, regarded as a uh, foreign word which was introduced to China maybe a century ago. It's a word from the West, although there are elements uh, related or similar to humanitarianism in Chinese culture. So the preference for a uh, developmental approach is a um, major character of China's involvement in humanitarian issues. Next slide, please. So in the next three slides, I will be discussing how uh, China has been contributing to the UN system in terms of funding. Although it's not exhaustive, because China also contributes through bilateral channel and other uh, initiatives that it launched, but at, at least it provides uh, a uh, overview or a general pattern of China's preference, China's uh, priorities in contribution, as well as uh, its level compared uh, in comparison with other donors. So this one is uh, China's contribution to the UN humanitarian issues or agencies in the period from uh, 2008 to 2020. And we can see the World Food Program has been the biggest uh, recipient accounting for over 60%. And this was um, followed by the World Health Organization, about 30%. So these two organizations actually received over 90% of China's donations. And other 
organizations actually have been uh, a recent de uh, destination for Chinese uh, funding. Uh, one is the SURF, Central Emergency Relief Fund, and another one is a uh, UNHCR, which received Chinese funding mostly in 2017, particularly during the uh, Belt and Road uh, Forum. So, we can see China prefer to contribute to food and uh, health issues. One more observation is that even within the food and secure uh, health sectors, China prefer a uh, natural hazard setting over conflict setting. So most of the funding China donated to uh, World uh, Food Program is more related to um, natural hazards or those general inse uh, food insecurity issues rather than um, induced by conflicts. Next slide, please. Uh, in the period I observe, I mean from 2008 to 2020, so 2017 saw the peak of Chinese uh, contribution to the UN funding. So, but even at the peak, the Chinese funding uh, share in the overall global funding uh, is only 1%. So, at the moment, within the UN system, China's uh, contribution to UN uh, humanitarian funds is um, still modest. So on the one hand, it means that there is space to expand. Well, on the other hand, it also sees um, uh, indicate China's interest in humanitarian issues. Maybe it's a gradual pro uh, graduate process. Next slide, please. So this is a comparison between China and uh, Japan. So we have seen uh, some rises in China's contribution in relation to uh, several uh, natural hazards or other crises like the 2011 food crisis in East Africa. So we see a rise in 2011 and the Ebola crisis in 2014 and the 2017 is related to the Belt and Road Initiative. So next slide, please. So how China has been conducting uh, humanitarian diplomacy during the COVID-19 outbreak? Uh, I think um, all of us have read uh, quite a lot of reports about uh, China's provision of medical supplies uh, like masks um, and uh, equipments to a lot of countries, both developing and developed countries. So this is, uh, this is the first characteristics of China's uh, humanitarian diplomacy in this period. Period, and the second one is a dispatch of uh, medical experts to uh, the uh, the countries in need, and the third form is the online conferences during which China's uh, Chinese experts from across China um, have uh, conferences with their counterparts, foreign counterparts, to share China's experience dealing with this uh, challenge, and also to provide training for countries where there is a need. And third, uh, the first one I would like to highlight is the proliferation of actors involved in this uh, process. Uh, actually, China, uh, uh, several batches of Chinese experts were from uh, the medical uh, the military uh, hospitals of China. So it means that the military has a role to play in this uh, setting. And the second one is uh, many of the experts were from the provincial hospital of China, which means that China uh, draw a lot of uh, strength and resources from its uh, provincial levels. And the third one is, uh, as Pat Faisal just mentioned, private foundations. So we have seen the proliferation of uh, humanitarian actors in China. Next slide, please. So what are the, op uh, this is the last uh, slide. So what are the opportunity and challenges uh, for China to expand its role? Uh, first, even before COVID-19, we have seen a uh, greater emphasis placed on the humanitarian development and peace nexus, which uh, conforms to what I mentioned, China's preference to developmental approach. And the second one uh, related to how we deliver humanitarian uh, assistance. Um, education actually was affected as a result of uh, the containment measures, particularly for countries um, uh, worse affected. So how we deliver uh, education, online uh, platform is uh, 
one option. So what China can contribute is to um, collaborate with countries um, in needs to um, build online platforms. And the second one is uh, digitalization of uh, maybe cash aid because China's uh, Alibaba Foundation or Alibaba uh, um, company uh, actually um, collaborated with Myanmar's uh, uh, financial uh, companies to develop like digital money projects. And the third one I will see is um, the consolidation of China's uh, preference for health issue as a entry point uh, for its uh, humanitarian diplomacy. However, China still faces challenges as its institutions are still evolving. So the implementation of many of its projects are still still relying on the United Nations uh, agencies. That brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Lena, for giving us some insights into China as an emerging donor in, in the humanitarian space. Um, I'd like now to turn to uh, Professor Meli Caballero anthony um, for her perspectives on what we can expect within, within this region. Professor Meli, over to you. Thank you, Al. And um, <clears throat> let me thank uh, the, my uh, co-panelists who have, uh, have wonderfully laid out the, uh, some of the trends that we now face and its uh, implications on some of the usual processes that uh, we are used to in the context of responding to the humanitarian challenges in front of us. Um, what I'd like to do with the, in the time allotted to me is essentially to reflect on some of these trends that have been described uh, earlier and to see how this now actually informs or uh, how this affects the, the regional landscape that we have and, in, and at the same time whether uh, the kind of processes that, uh, that have been defined earlier will actually be affecting not just the actors that have uh, emerged but more importantly, the extent to which they have been responsive to the challenges that we have uh, ahead of us. Uh, Barry talked about a cognitive crisis that we all face. And <clears throat> I like the word habit of mind. And true enough, if you look at the way uh, many of us here in the context of the region, think about how we respond to crises, the experience over the last few years and more recently in the last decade has shown that we're still really very much in you know, our comfort zone. Moving away from the comfort zone is extremely difficult, easier said than done. And the comfort zone is not just because we feel that that's the way it is, it's really also because comfort zones are defined by the structures, right, and the processes that we have. If I could just step back and just think about how this actually plays out. Uh, we already know um, with COVID and even before that, that the kind of challenges that we have that causes a lot of humanitarian crises are increasingly becoming more complex and that they have cross-border implications. In the center, especially as far as the NTS Center and the NTS Asia Consortium, that we are a part of, we always think of security beyond borders because what we do affects others and what others do affects us. So it's not just a question therefore of you know, what we do affects others, but there's the other intervening variable that has been described by Faisal and that is really the role of technology. We all talk about the fourth industrial revolution and it's supposed to actually be more enabling rather than hindering progress. But if the combination of these dynamics, as far as the, you know, the impact of that on the security of peoples, societies, and states can, are not also actually uh, equal across all, right? I mean, there are those that benefit and there are those that don't benefit for it. We talked about technology as one that's supposed to be uh, leveling off the playing field, but as we see, it isn't really. So how does that, how do these trends and technology actually impact 
on our state of mind and the way we respond to things. And when, when you talk about uh, actors becoming more important, uh, Faisal talked about, you know, increasingly uh, there will be roles for regional foundations, for private actors, and uh, even, you know, se several groups that may, may not be as organized as, as how, how other institutions are. But while we expect other actors to come in, in the context, for example, of Southeast Asia, more strengthening of regional organizations like ASEAN, more, of, uh, more functions given or responsibilities given to, for example, an institution, an ASEAN institution, like, uh, like, like for example, our AHA Center. There's also the question of, you know, the kind of mandates that we have is, are the kind of mandates and responsibilities that we ascribe to these institutions actually allow them to move beyond that comfort zone and to, uh, to prevent what we call a cognitive crisis, I really like that word barriers, <laughs> in responding and being responsive to crises. And much as we like to think that, you know, there are many institutions out there, AHA and others, that really want to do more, you know, processes hold them back. And the reason why certain processes hold them back is because we cannot seem to get around that mindset, that habit of mind. And habit of mind is defined not just by our experiences, but also by the kind of norms, regional norms that we have, you know, that we have absorbed that, or we have sort of adopted in this region. And that becomes even more complex in when we talk about expectations about how institutions actually respond, right? I mean, if I could just talk about another trend that Pat Faisal talk, uh, mentioned earlier, the trend to greater, uh, the movement towards nationalism, more nationalism, rather than, you know, more multilateral approach. And the reason why there is, again, one of the reasons rather why people have become more more inward looking is because if you look at the kind of challenges that people, state societies face, uh, we look at COVID-19 as one and its impact on, you know, the economic futures of, of people where you, you know, in the you, context of the United States, you have 40 million people just becoming unemployed overnight, right? So you have this tensions about needing institutions to respond more to, to new crises and to even be more responsive, anticipatory, having the right skills, right? But you have the, you know, the, the, the pull factor of, of the inability of certain institutions to provide and hence you have increased nationalism that gets in the way of more collaborative and collective responses. So, while it is, I think it is extremely important to be as responsive and as anticipatory as possible, we have to address the more important question. How do you change the processes that define or that hinder a more proactive approach? So I don't have easy answers to that. And I think that is something that we can, you know, that we can talk about. Uh, you know, I, I, I put that across for, for discussion. But I think it's, it's, it is an important uh, uh, question because it affects not just the humanitarian world, but the other communities and the other worlds that need to respond to these challenges. And most of all, uh, one more thing before, I, before I, you know, I end is, while we have all these processes that we need to, or, or, or obstacles, processes that obstruct certain things, I also like to, to bring back the question of trust that Pat Faisal has said. Is it because in the, you know, in the, in the eagerness to, to adopt certain things, we alienate certain people and, her, uh, and our certain communities, right? And in the process of doing so, only exacerbate mistrust rather than foster trust. Okay, Al, thank you. Thank you, Professor Mali. So we've heard from four very interesting speakers on today's topic of humanitarian futures in a post-COVID world. If participants want to ask a question, please use the chat function at the bottom, um, and we will collate those, those questions to ask the panelists. 
on the first question, and this is um, a broader theme uh, that's been coming out, but with this discussion, we're talking about mindset shifts and we're thinking about the big picture. And um, what role do local NGOs play in this uh, new future? Uh, and is it also being seen as perhaps uh, a, a shift towards greater nationalism uh, rather than necessarily localization, which we hear a lot about uh, in conversations about the future of the humanitarian space in this region. So perhaps if I can turn to the panelists to reflect on, on that broad question, and I'll, I'll turn to you in turn that you spoke. So, uh, Beris? Thanks, uh, Alistair. Uh, the question that you pose sounds simple, but actually opens up a number of parallel lines of discussion. On the first point about localization, I just recall again my comment about language, because localization has been subverted uh, and will only ever be subverted if we don't address the systemic injustice in the global economy. And I think this is where discussions around humanitarian assistance as aid trap us into operating in less than 2% of the world's resources when there are 98% of resources being made available for other purposes. It brings in this notion of more work on prevention, environmental issues and what have you. On the issue of migration, I'm sorry, I'm already taking too much time. We are stuck in a used future. The notion of the sovereign nation state comes from the 17th century. And it was developed by Europeans who just spent 100 years fighting about religious issues. We forget that human mobility is a phenomena of the, of the millennia. It's not going to stop because we've drawn some lines on the map. And this is a great example to me of how we have to completely rethink what's a refugee or a displaced person or a person seeking asylum other than somebody who moved the same way my forebears did to find a better life or to escape natural disasters or other emergencies. So I'd like to bring the two together to say, where nation states refuse to allow local refugee camps to grow their own food, look after their own water and waste management, generate their own energy, because it's seen as an, as an invasion of their national sovereignty, we are stopping the best part of our ability to respond to the humanitarian crisis. Aid is never going to be enough. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Pat Kaisel? Thank you, Al. Uh, any specific question uh, you want me to answer or based oh, the, on the, the questions about the role of uh, local NGOs? How do you see their role playing out in the future was one part. The second part was whether when we're seeing localization play out now and in the future, are we really looking at nationalization? Mm, thank, thank you. Uh, a question that we need to ask before answering that question is why, uh, what would be the challenge for, from a, a donor country to go direct <clears throat> to the local NGO uh, instead of channeling to several uh, international organizations before going to the, a uh, local NGO? And, and donors has a a valid uh, reason. It's called accountability. Now, uh, there is a price that we have to pay for this accountability. I mean, uh, it would be much easier for any donors to give aid to organization that already are famous for their accountability, regardless whether it's efficient, regardless whether it's being effective, because much easier to justify it is much easier to justify a parliament to any organization that already in the world map. But local NGO is unheard for some, some already growing. So if we talk about uh, what should be done uh, in order to bridge the gap, I think it's a, a, an issue that has been uh, discussed quite some time. Uh, it's called a, a rating mechanism. I don't know uh, an organization that is having a high standard of accountability 
perhaps in, in Africa or Zimbabwe or any part of the world. But a rating mechanism uh, will provide an access that I can trust this organization. If you go to a stock market, it's a plenty of uh, uh, organization that will tell whether this stock is worth investing or not. But when we go to the humanitarian market, it's very difficult to find a emerging market, we call it, or emerging NGOs that worth for investment. So the choice will always the usual suspect because it's much easier to justify why we are channeling the funding to them. So what, what should be done? I think uh, uh, more and more uh, for the local uh, NGO, it's, it's about the focus on which area that we need to, uh, what we call strengthen. I call it uh, performance drivers. Performance driver is number one is governance. So any local NGOs, if we want to step up, then we need to master or be very good in this governance. What is the governance? The rule, the regulation, the strategy, the accountability mechanism, anything that really govern an organization and can be trusted by those outside our organization. And number two is about human capital. It is investment in people. That's it. I mean, us, our team, when did the last time we send people to a training, a leadership training, a management training, communication training, negotiation training, all of this training will determine how this organization will negotiate, talk and present themselves in front of donors. Uh, so that, that too is already uh, making uh, an impact. If it, my final uh, thought is, if an organization working on disaster management, we need to understand both, understanding, understanding disaster and understanding management. When we want to grow, when organizations want to excel, understanding management uh, will produce more results than understanding disaster. Because that is a game changer. How good we are in managing uh, our organization. I think that uh, would be my quick comment, Al. Uh, thank you. Uh, Lena, there's been a specific question directed uh, to you and China's a role in relief activities. Um, would you like to reflect on that and whether it has been uh, essentially tied to their national economic interests and perhaps reflect on what that, the implications are for that in the way it engages in, in this space? It does it all. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, my observation is that there are several drivers before behind whether, uh, whether a country provide aid and where the country provide aid. Economic interest, in my opinion, is of course one of the drivers, but I would be hesitant to, uh, I, I would be reluctant to say that it's closely, China's um, economic uh, interest is closely uh, related to its uh, humanitarian aid. Actually, other factors that um, can shape or have shaped China's uh, humanitarian aid, I would say include its uh, resources and capacity, and its uh, self-position in the international system, as well as the values China subscribed to. So uh, in a nutshell, I would say economic interest is one of the drivers, but I don't think it's uh, the only or the most important driver. Thank you. Thanks, Lena. Professor Melly, I'm wondering if you'd like to, to reflect on the localization question and perhaps what impact that might have on how we coordinate between the different actors in the humanitarian space going forward. And that will be the, the last of our, our questions. Thanks, Al. I, I think it is an important uh, agenda to, uh, to address uh, this whole notion of localization. But if you, I don't think it is as difficult as, or as uh, controversial as some uh, people may think it is. And it's not necessarily a polar opposite to, to this thing about nationalism in a positive sense. Uh, but there is a, an, uh, an important thing that has to be uh, important requirement for local for localization to succeed, and one is, uh, as mentioned by 
Faisal, Pat Faisal earlier, is the need for local groups, local communities to first establish the competence to do so and they can be, uh, and they can be confident if they have the confidence to do so. And in so, in so being, uh, er, then able to respond and work with in a more constructive uh, and in a more participatory way with other uh, actors in the humanitarian world. I guess it is important to recognize that localization is not just giving authority mm -hmm. to local groups, but it's also ensuring that local communities have the competence to do so. so helping them develop the kind of skills, the kind of training that allows them to be more, uh, I, I hate the word, more competent in dealing with these issues. Not to, uh, not to ignore though, that there is also a lot of local knowledge that can be derived from the practices of local NGOs. And that local knowledge, however, ha uh, they have to be developed to ensure that this local knowledge uh, is, is uh, to the extent helpful and in fact, actually also in tune with the demands of the humanitarian, uh, humanitarian challenges. So, you know, support, uh, development of skills and recognition gives the local NGOs and the local groups the confidence to say, we are an important part of this humanitarian world. Thank you, Professor Mali. Uh, I'd like to thank the four panelists for your time today. Uh, and for the questions that were put into the chat function at the bottom. For those questions that we did not get chance to ask, uh, we will be reviewing those uh, after the session and I will ask them to, to the panelists and we will find a way to communicate uh, those answers to you. So on behalf of us here at the Center for Non-Traditional Security Studies, I'd like to thank you for joining us this afternoon for our webinar on humanitarian futures in a post-COVID world. Thank you.